Hey guys, happy ring Thursday. Um, I'm here to kick off our bonding units with a video on ionic bonding versus covalent bonding. So I wanna start off with a question. So let's say I have two things, substances, both white, both kind of crystal-like. I got one here, one here. They are not the same substance. What are some ways I could safely use chemistry to figure out what they are? What makes them different? What makes them similar? How can I identify which one's which? Well, there's lots of different ideas out there, but the reality is these two things are held together with different types of chemical bonds. So what we could do is we could test some properties that maybe make um, some, the properties that maybe fall under a covalent bonding category versus an ionic bonding category. Some things um, that might be helpful is we could try to melt these things. Um, usually covalently bonded substances will melt at lower temperatures than ionically bonded substances. We could, in theory, try to boil them, but I think melting will be hard enough. We could try to figure out the density of these things. Um, we could see if they dissolve in water, and if they do dissolve in water, do they conduct electricity or not? Um, we could try to figure out the specific heat capacity. Um, we could obviously use taste and smell um, as well to identify substances. We would just have to be careful that we know it's something that's safe to taste. So there's lots of different ways we can identify what substances are, and a lot of times the different properties substances have are because they're held together with different types of bonds. So this short video has a couple goals. I want you to know um, the difference between ionic and covalent bonding, be able to compare and contrast. I want you to be able to look at a chemical formula and tell me if it's molecular, which is covalent, or if that formula is ionic. And then I want you to be able to tell me if a chemical bond is ionic, polar covalent, or non-polar covalent. So there's two types of covalent bonds we're gonna learn about. So let's start with some simple definitions. Ionic bonding occurs when we have one substance that gives electrons and the other substance takes those electrons. Covalent bonding occurs when two atoms share their electrons with each other. Okay, and I got a nice little joke. A covalent bond yells over at the ionic bond. Didn't anybody ever teach you to share? Yeah, <laughs> so funny. Okay, so let's talk really quickly about ionic bonds. This will happen when we transfer valence electrons. So we know that sodium has one valence electron. I'm just going to draw that one dot. We know that chlorine has seven valence electrons. So I'm just going to draw dots to show the valence, not all the electrons. And what happens is we know sodium wants to get rid of one, chlorine wants to take one, and so we are going to give this electron here from sodium to chlorine. So the metal, sodium, gives an electron, which will create a positive charge because it lost that electron. And the nonmetal will take the negative electron, making it a negative charge. Because we have a positive and a negative, they now attract each other and are chemically bonded. Ionic bonds happen between these different combinations. So I want you to put all of these in your notes. A, a metal and a nonmetal, and the metal will be the positive one. The nonmetal will be the negative. Then we have a positive metal who could give an electron to a polyatomic ion. Here's what polyatomic means. It means multiple atoms with a charge. Okay, we'll learn more about those next semester, but again, just know that it could be a metal with something that has multiple atoms bonded together. It could be a polyatomic ion with a positive charge and a negative nonmetal, or it could be a positive polyatomic ion with a negative. So for right now, I just need you to write these down. We will focus mostly on metal and nonmetals, but I'll show you a couple with polyatomics just so you get used to seeing them. Not a big deal. I'll show you a quick way to find them. All right, so a covalent bond is... Um, going to happen when we share valence electrons and the reason two elements will share is because they both need them to become a full outer shell so iodine has seven valence electrons i'm just going to draw seven dots ignoring all the other ones let's bond it to a second iodine who also has seven valence well they both want one more electron. So if I give it away like ionic they both won't be happy but what if we share them so now Iodine has one, two, three, four, five, six. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six. And we can turn those two into a bond like this. And so there are two electrons in the bond, one from this iodine, one from this iodine, but both iodines feel like they have those electrons. They're sharing them. 
So for covalent bonds, it's going to be between a nonmetal and a nonmetal. And just for a little vocab, a molecular compound is when we have two or more atoms that are bonded covalently. So if I say, is this ionic or molecular, I'm really asking you, is it ionic or covalent? So molecular and covalent are synonyms. All right, just a reminder from last unit, we have our periodic table. This right here is the metalloid staircase. So these kind of pinkish red elements have some properties of metals, some properties of nonmetals. All of these purple elements are metals. So most of the elements on the periodic table are metals. Everything to the right of the staircase are called nonmetals, except don't forget about hydrogen. Hydrogen's kind of sneaky. He really belongs maybe over here with the other nonmetals. We'll learn more why he's on this side, but basically everything to the left is a metal except for hydrogen, and these green ones above the staircase are the nonmetals. So here's what we're going to do. We, we're going to identify the following as ionic or covalent. Some things we're going to look for. If we see... A metal, it's ionic. If we see more than two capital letters, it's also going to be ionic because that means that there is a polyatomic ion. So really what we're looking for for covalent is a nonmetal and a nonmetal. Okay, so let's do the first one together. I see sodium which is on the left of my metalloid staircase, that is a metal, and sulfur is above the staircase, a non-metal. So I have a metal and a non-metal. That's going to make this ionic. On my periodic table, I find nitrogen, that's a non-metal, and oxygen is a non-metal. That makes this covalent, or you could call it molecular. Same with here. Carbon, oxygen are both above the staircase. I have two non-metals. I'm going to skip that one and have you guys try it. See you, that's a CL. Okay, so just two capital letters there. Let's look at this one, CH4. Carbon, I know, is a non-metal. Hydrogen is on the left of the, the staircase, but remember, hydrogen is actually all a non-metal as well. Don't don't let him trick you. So even though hydrogen's on the left of the staircase, he is a nonmetal. So that gives me another covalent compound. And then I'm going to skip and look at this guy, KNO3. So what I see is a, I see a metal, that's potassium. And I see two nonmetals. Well, remember, if we have more than two capital letters, that's a polyatomic ion. I'm going to abbreviate that PAI. So if I have a metal with a polyatomic ion, that's going to be ionic. Anytime for this class you see more than two capital letters, it's going to be ionic. Okay? So I skipped, let's get my highlighter out. I skipped this one, I skipped this one, and I skipped this one. I want you to try those three. Um, pause the video, tell me if they are ionic or covalent. And I'm going to put the answers up in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so we have a metal copper with a nonmetal chlorine making it ionic. Don't forget hydrogen's a nonmetal, oxygen's a nonmetal, so that's covalent. And then we have iron, which is a metal, with iodine, which is a nonmetal, so this one is ionic. All right. There are two different types of covalent bonds. So just a friendly reminder, covalent bonds are happening between two non-metal elements and they are sharing electrons. Well, when you share with somebody, you can either share equally or unequally. So I have non-polar covalent. That is when two atoms are sharing their electrons equally. So think about um, if maybe your parents are divorced and they have equal custody. So you do every other week. One week at moms, one week at dads. One week at moms, one week at dads. That is non-polar covalent. Okay, so that's usually going to happen between two elements that are exactly the same. Oxygen with oxygen. No one's pulling the electrons more um, than the other. Fluorine and fluorine. No one's pulling more. Carbon and hydrogen together is also another good example. So when carbon bonds with hydrogen, they are nonpolar covalent. They share equally, relatively. Okay, Polar covalent is when two 
non-metal atoms share unequally. So one of those atoms is hogging the electrons and pulling them towards itself, even though they're quote unquote sharing. So hydrogen with fluorine does this. You can see this picture is trying to show you that the bigger the bubble, the more the electrons in this bond are being pulled this direction. So fluorine hogs the electrons from hydrogen. H2O is another great example, okay? So there's two hydrogens with one oxygen. The oxygen hogs the electrons from those two hydrogens. Here's that HF again. Um, so fluorine has some some these um, valence electrons on it. We'll learn more about those later. But the reality is here's the bond with the shared electrons and fluorine's pulling those electrons in the bond towards itself in addition to the ones it has around it. But it's pulling those. And so we say that it's electron rich and um, hydrogen is electron poor. Well, if fluorine is pulling those electrons, electrons are negative, it will have a partial negative charge and hydrogen will be kind of positive. So this symbol means partial. We put a partial negative and a partial positive. Um, so that's showing that they're sharing unequally when you see this partial negative and partial positive. The one that has the partial negative is the one that's hogging the electrons. So how am I supposed to know if something's polar, covalent, or nonpolar? We already talked about how to figure out if it's ionic versus covalent. We just look at the metals and nonmetals. Um, but you can kind of do this mathematically. If you look on your periodic table, in the bottom right-hand corner of every element, there is a number that is the electronegativity. So if I have two atoms that are going to bond together, what I can do is subtract the electronegativity of the first atom minus the second atom. You should always have a positive answer, so if it comes out negative, just take the absolute value or make it positive, okay? We're comparing the difference. So difference means subtraction. So if I subtract element A, electronegativity from element B, if the difference is between zero and 0.4, it is nonpolar covalent. It means they are sharing equally. So they share equal, okay? I think of it as like my mom is not a polar bear when my brother and I share equally. If I share equally with my brother, my mom is not a polar bear. Okay, if we have 0.5 to 1.6, so when I subtract the electronegativities of those two atoms and the answer is between 0.5 and 1.6, it is usually a polar covalent bond, which means they don't share equally. And when I don't share equally with my brother, that makes my mom act like a polar bear. She gets mad. Okay, and then we have anything bigger than 1.7 is usually going to be an ionic bond. That's where we transfer. So it's just a give me, no sharing happening. What I want you to understand, this is a good trick, but it's, it's more of a spectrum, right? We share equally, we partially transfer, we share unequally is a nicer way to say it, and then a full transfer, just gimme, gimme. Okay, so these numbers here, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, that's a little fuzzy, okay? We need to use other evidence too, like is it a metal with a non-metal? 1.6 to 1.7, that's a little fuzzy. We need to pay attention, is there, sorry, we need to pay attention um, here, are they the same element or not? Here, we need to pay attention to, are they two non-metals or are they two metals? So just, I just wanna throw it out there, this is a great rule to know, um, but there might be a couple exceptions. There might be a time where I have two non-metals, which is covalent, but their difference is maybe like 1.8. Okay, well, we'll probably still call that polar covalent. It's just very polar covalent, right? Or maybe we have something that's a metal and a non-metal, but the difference is only 1.5. Well, because it's a metal with a non-metal, we're going to call it ionic. So again, just be, you can definitely use this, but don't panic if your teacher tells you about a couple exceptions. We are going to look at lots of different components and pieces of evidence when we decide if it's non-polar, polar, or ionic. Hopefully this helps um, and I will see you guys in class.